we have finished now discussing the reveal preference methods and we're going to switch to the only express preference method that we're going to talk about which is contingent evaluation. So express preference methods deal with hypothetical questions. They don't I was going to say they don't deal with real data. Well, of course the answer to a hypothetical question is real data, but they don't deal with people actually spending money in the real world and making inferences from that whereas the reveal preference method did depend on collecting data on how people were spending money in the real world all right so contingent evaluation the the description is actually pretty straightforward Suppose the question is, how much do people value saving the whales? So you could ask a, a willingness and ability to pay question. And willingness and ability to pay, I abbreviate it by WATP, and I call it willingness and ability to pay. But your book uses the standard name for it, which is just uh, willingness to pay leaves out the word and ability and therefore the standard acronym is WTP. So you can ask people how much are you willing to pay to save the whales? Or you can ask their willingness to accept. If we decide to let whales go extinct, how much money would it take for you to how much money would we have to give you in order for you to be equally as well off with the money and extinct whales as you would be if you didn't have the money but whales didn't go extinct. All right, this is particularly good for option values because you can't observe people spending money on option values. Remember an option value for Yellowstone National Park is the value you put on Yellowstone National Park just because you might want to visit it in the future but you're not visiting it right now and so you haven't incurred any travel costs uh, or um, you know it could be an option value of a bequest I might want to give I, I, I might I might be happy that my grandchildren get to visit Yellowstone National Park so you, that's a purely psychological feeling value is a psychological feeling and so I'm not saying that's unimportant on the contrary, psychological feelings are what economics is all about. We're trying to make we're trying to make people happy. But you can't get data on psychological feelings easily unless you just ask people, and so that's basically what contingent evaluation does, is it, it just asks people, because that's the only way to get to get data on on something like option values. So the description of contingent evaluation is is pretty simple. We will be talking about, uh, as we get into some of the problems, we will be talking about the design of the surveys, what kinds of questions you want to ask, and that can get more complicated than it at first appears. But let's go in order. Problem number one is understating your willingness and ability to pay. So suppose a survey is going to be run in the following manner. The question is going to be how much are you willing to pay how much are you willing and able to pay to save the whales? And the survey takers are going to tell the people who are taking the survey the following that it's not an anonymous survey. It's a survey where you're required to state your name and give the sur survey taker your address and your social security number. And the government is going to What's going to happen with the survey responses is that the government's going to look at the survey responses. And if people are willing and able to pay lots of money in aggregate, so when you add everybody who took the survey together, if that aggregate is a big number, then the government is going to save the whales. But if the aggregate is a small number, then the government's going to let the whales go extinct. But in this survey design, it's not anonymous. And if the government decides to save the whales, it is going to take note of how much money each person who took the survey said they were willing and able to pay to save the whales 
and then the government's going to increase your taxes by that amount. So that if you said you're going to pay a certain amount of money to save the whales, you were willing and able to pay a certain amount of money to save the whales, and if the government does decide to save the whales, then you're going to have to pay that money. In that context, if you're going to have to pay your declared WATP, now, you don't have to pay it if the government decides not to save the whales. But if the government does decide to save the whales, you're going to have to pay your WATP. Then you might be tempted to understate it. You might be thinking, you know, 10,000 people are going to take this survey. I'm just one out of 10,000 people, or one out of 100,000 people. The government's going to make its decision based on what all 10,000 people say. Well, I'm just one guy. Um, my true willingness to save the whales, to, to pay to save the whales, is $100 a year. But if I didn't tell the truth and I just said it was $10 a year, is that really going to make a difference in terms of whether whales get saved or not? So, reasoning along these lines, if you are willing not to tell the truth, then you have a clear incentive to understate your WTP. And, of course, it's a problem because everybody who takes a survey has an incentive to understate their WTP. And so the aggregate WTP might be too small, and the government might make the wrong decision. Maybe the right decision is to save the whales, and the government decides not to do so. That's problem number one. Problem number two, understating WATP. So let me change the scenario now. The basic framework is the same. The question is, are you willing to save the whales? The government's conducting a survey. If the aggregate WATP is large, the government's going to save the whales. Otherwise, it's not. But this time, it's an anonymous survey. So the government has no idea what anybody has said. And so you're not going to have to pay your declared WATP. Well, under these circumstances, again, if your true willingness and ability to pay to save the whales is $100, you might say $100 because you value truth-telling. But you might also say, you know, I really want the whales to be saved. And this is just an anonymous survey. So even though my true WATP is $100, why don't I tell the survey taker that it's $200? or $500, or $5,000. I don't suffer any bad consequences by not telling the truth in this kind of way, and it makes, me, makes it more likely that the whales get saved. So in that scenario, you have an incentive to, to understate, I mean to overstate WATP, whereas problem number one in the other scenario was an understating problem. Uh, now, I, I wanted to, to point out here, so this is sort of related, I just call it problem 2A, it's, it's related to problem 2, it's also related, I guess, to problem number 1. Uh, what if instead of being asked your willingness to pay to save the whales, you were being asked your willingness to accept compensation in case the government decided to let whales go extinct? Then, depending on the, uh, uh, depending on the scenario, well, let's see, uh, maybe it doesn't depend on the scenario. If um, if it's not an anonymous survey, so if you're actually going to be paid by the government, then you certainly have an incentive to overstate your WTA, because if the government decides to let whales go extinct, that's the money that's coming back to you. That's that's going to your into your pocket. If it's not, if it's an anonymous survey. So you're not actually going to be getting any money if the government decides to let the whales go extinct because the government doesn't know who you are. You still have an incentive to overstate WTA because if you want to save the whales, the bigger you, the bigger your stated WTA, the more the chance that the government's actually going to save the whales. So regardless of whether the survey is anonymous or not, you have an incentive to overstate your willingness to accept compensation if the whales go extinct. So this is the way economists have thought about these problems.
one of the most famous uh, environmental economists uh, is Jason Shogren, a professor, uh, he may be retired now, at the uh, University of, of Wyoming. And Shogun is one of the few environmental economists, academic environmental economists, who does experimental economics as well. So I, I believe it was Shogun. I'm not exactly sure, but I believe it was Shogun who who did an experiment with undergraduate students at a university, putting them in different scenarios to try to detect overstating and understating WATP. I mean one one theoretical way to do it is you get 200 undergraduates, you divide them into two groups of 100 each. You put one of the groups in this setting and the other group in this setting. Your null hypothesis is that on average they're going to have the same willingness and ability to pay to save the whales because you just assign them randomly to one of the two groups. But the settings are different and so if the setting is actually influencing them to understate and overstate, then you anticipate that the average WATP is going to be really different in the anonymous survey group versus the non-anonymous survey group. Whereas if they're not paying a lot of attention to the setting, or they don't really care about the setting, maybe they want to tell the truth regardless of what the setting is, then you would expect that there wouldn't be much difference between the average WATP of the group that's taking the anonymous survey versus the group that's taking the non-anonymous survey. So in any case, uh, I, I think it was Shogun, but I don't, I don't exactly remember who it was, who did this experiment, and what they found, it was kind of interesting. Most undergraduate students were not sensitive to the different settings, anonymous setting versus non-anonymous setting. The if if you look at most if you take a, a group of typical undergraduates split them in half put one in an anonymous setting and the other in a non-anonymous setting and ask a WATP question the two groups come up with just about the same average WATP but if you do it with economics majors that's not true what they found is that if you do it with economics majors, economics majors are sensitive to the setting. You do get a, a lower WATP in a non-anonymous setting than you do in an anonymous setting. So the question is, is it because economics majors understand the situation better. They understand the setting. They think about their incentives. In other words, they they know how to think through these kinds of scenarios better than other students where they're more used to it. And so they understand where the incentives lie. Uh, that's one possibility. But another possibility is that economic majors don't care about lying, but students in other fields don't like to tell lies. Um, so that's this topic. Uh, let me skip to this topic. I'll, I'll get. I'll. I'll do the. Uh, I'll, I'll do this one here a little bit later. So the question is. Do people value truth telling? Do they cherish truth telling? Economists tend to think the answer is no, that people are selfish and they're just going to do what's in their own individual self interest. And if telling a lie is in their own individual self interest, they're just going to, people are going to lie. And the, the reason economists think that is related to what you might call social Darwinism. Um, I mean, social Darwinism, I will define, is a thing. Um, and you it, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with truth-telling, but I think there's related. Um, social Darwinism is the idea that just like you think of evolution as, as an arena where the fittest survives, survival of the fittest, 
that society is like that too. And so that as, as time goes on, um, society develops in ways that benefit the people who are maybe smarter, harder working, uh, better fit for society. So that um, the people who prosper in society are better in some ways than people who don't prosper. Just like the species that survive in evolution are better in some ways than the species that don't survive. Now social Darwinism is extremely controversial. Um, and basically what I'm going to do is criticize it. So if you're a social Darwinist, you're fairly likely to think that people will lie whenever it's in their own self-interest and that people, sh in fact, that people should lie when it's in their own self-interest so that they can get ahead because that means they'll, more, they'll be more successful and they'll kind of, yeah, they'll enjoy more success in the survival of the fittest race that society is. Charles Darwin himself was not a social Darwinist at all. Darwin thought, uh, and, and, and even, so let's, let's set society aside, um, he didn't even believe when you're talking about just biological e evolution of non-human species that evolution that evolutionary success of a species involved the evolutionary success and selfishness of the individual what darwin himself thought is that individuals who were not selfish and did not act in their own best interest but rather were altruistic and acted in the best interest of other individuals, other members of that species, might end up being part of a very successful species. In other words, the, the successful species, like for instance humans, might be ones that are characterized by individuals that are willing to be altruistic, not selfish. This was called, and is now called, uh, group selection. So in other words, it's not evolutionary selection for the individual, it's evolutionary selection for the group or for the species. Darwin's idea about this, that, that altruistic behavior might lead to might, might, might be selected for in the process of evolution because it leads to the success of the group or the species fell out of favor in the in the late 19th century and early 20th century but by the late 20th century mid to late 20th century it was revived in particular by a very famous biologist who was a professor at Harvard named E.O. Wilson Wilson was a really famous scientist but he also wrote a lot of books for lay people about science and about biology. Wilson's research area was studying ants. And ants are a really good example of a species where you've got a whole lot of altruism going on and, this, and, and different species of ants are extremely successful. E, but they don't, they don't act as selfish individuals. In evolutionary biology, this is now called multi-level selection theory. So the idea is mm, um, you have selection going on at the level of genes. You might have heard the term selfish gene. So genes are in a, a alternate genes for a certain characteristic are in a sort of quote-unquote struggle with each other for to see which gene is going to become more prominent. Um, different kind of individuals are too. So that's the gene level, the individual level, but then there's also the group level. And so you have selection going on at all of these levels. And altruism might be bad at one level, but good at a higher level, at a level that includes more organisms. So 
the social Darwinist idea, which is, I don't want to say common among economists, but I think it, it influences some of what uh, many economists think about, maybe in a subtle way. I mean, I'm not trying to say that economists are social Darwinists, but um, but certainly when they they talk about, let's say, firms and uh, the competition of firms, the language they use is, is somewhat similar to to evolution. In fact, uh, Darwin um, Darwin read Thomas Malthus. Malthus was an early you know, 19th century economist. Uh, Robert Thomas Malthus. I'm not going to ask you this on an exam. Um, he was the first person to worry about uh, overpopulation uh, of of humans. Um, but he was but he was a very important economist, and um, Darwin read Malthus's work on economics, and it is at least plausible that Darwin got the idea about competition and uh, survival of the fittest uh, uh, indirectly from Malthus, uh, which is one of the rare times when you have an economist actually influencing science. It usually goes the other way around. Maybe it's the only time that you have economics influencing science. Um, So the 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 implication for what we're talking about is maybe society, maybe evolution selects has selected in the human species for altruism as an important trait, not a trait that's always shown, but a trait that's pretty important and shows up a lot. And Part of altruism then would be telling the truth. You wouldn't want to tell a lie because that might hurt somebody else. So maybe economists are way too worried about problem number one, problem number two, and problem number two A. Economists model our idea that people are happy to lie as long as it's in their own selfish best interest is probably not a correct reading of human nature. Economists are not experts on human nature, to be sure, and so this may be over, this may be overstating things that 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 people are so willing to to not be truthful. Now the question about econ majors, you know, is it because the people who decide to major in economics are the ones that, on average, are more willing to tell lies, or is it that when you take a lot of economics classes, you learn that telling a lie can get you ahead and therefore you start to be more eager to tell lies? I don't know. I mean, whatever it is, it doesn't say anything, I think, particularly good about about the economics profession. But um, let's leave that aside. I'm going to... I think I'm going to stop here. I haven't done... I haven't done um, here the the Vickery Groves mechanism. So that's that's where I'm going to start in the next video.